So the first thing I want to tell you is that this issue of um, what I like to call antibiotic injured or antibiotic harmed is of really personal significance to me because as many of you know, my daughter was born by a C-section, received IV antibiotics during the delivery and at birth in the neonatal ICU, received a ton of antibiotics in her first two years of life, about 20 courses before she was even in PK. And uh, all of these things really conspired to make her a very sickly child. And so, you know, when I read these studies, it just, it, it really is the biggest regret I have as a parent is, you know, I wish I could have a redo for her birth and um, early years, but we don't. And there's a lot to celebrate. She's a healthy 17 year old. Um, but, you know, we know so much more now than we knew 17 years ago or even seven years ago or even two years ago. So the science, I mean, I, I follow this stuff very closely and these articles, these scientific articles are just mind blowing. And, you know, we can't change a past, but we have to do better going forward when we think of antibiotic stewardship. So um, I'm just looking at something in the chat here. Okay, that's fine, Gina. Um, and remember that these are all recorded and they're archived. It usually takes a couple of days to get them up on uh, Office Hours. But if you go to gutless.com on the Office Hours page, you'll see all the archived ones. So for example, we have the gut sleep one from last week. And then if you head over to Instagram, there's a little post I did about the foods, um, good snack foods, and uh, basically things like peanuts, sesame seeds are really good to snack on in terms of tryptophan foods. But back to today. Um, so this has significance for me as a physician and also as a parent, as a mother whose child had a lot of antibiotics. So before we get to antibiotics in adults, let me just hip you to some of the information about antibiotics in children. So early antibiotic use in infancy is associated with all kinds of neuropsychiatric and cognitive problems in children later on, including anxiety, depression, atten attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, there's a big study that shows that antibiotics in the first six months of life is associated with depression at age three and lower cognition, essentially defects in cognition at age 11. So the important thing there is the delay, right? So you can get antibiotics, you know, at three months old or at birth as my daughter did, and you can see those effects without subsequent antibiotic exposure. You can see those effects lasting years later. And that was a really interesting thing about this study. So let's dive into this study. This study was published in March of this year of 2022. And it was a population based study using the nurses health registry. So the nurses health registry is one of the largest registers we have of uh, be being able to evaluate the effects of various things, medications, etc in a large population. And so this is female nurses. The registry, which started, I think, in 1989, is over 100, 000, registered over 100,000 female nurses. But for this particular study, the number was about 14,500. So what they did is they had an initial, they use an evaluation tool called COGSTATE, cognitive state, and it, affect, it, it assesses a lot of different things. So psychomotor skills, learning, memory, et cetera. So they had the baseline test administered at a, in around 2009, I believe it was. So they had baseline levels for all the women in the study, these female nurses, and then they came back between 2014 and 2018 and had them repeat the study. So this is at least seven years for most of the participants after that initial assessment, okay? They had them repeat the COG state, the same test. And again, about 14,500 women. Now they really were able to account for variables like socioeconomic status, education, diet, alcohol, who was taking antidepressants, subsequent antibiotic use, et cetera. So they were able to confound, to, to eliminate these confounding factors that could affect, these are all things that can affect cognition, obesity, presence of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And they looked at global cognition as well as the sort of psychomotor speed and uh, how quickly people were learning things and memory. And what they found was pretty astounding. So two months or more of antibiotic use. So they, they sort of quantified antibiotic use in this 
cohort of 14,500 and something women to like no antibiotic use at all, really limited, like zero to 14 days, um, less than two months and then greater than two months. And what they found is that in the greater than two month group, greater than two months of antibiotic use over a period of about four years. So spread out, not two months at one time, but you could get a 10 day course you know, in the spring and a 10 day course in the fall. And you do that every year for a few years and pretty soon you're up to that over two months. That was associated with about, it was I think minus seven on the scale, a, a significant global drop in cognition. But if we try and quantify these numbers, you know, a minus three in this and a minus four in that, what does that really mean? you know, in, in terms that we can understand and appreciate for our real life. So here's a really dramatic finding. It was equivalent to about three to four years of aging on the brain, okay? So I don't know about you, but I'm very concerned about aging in my brain. I am already aging and I don't want my, as we all are, and I don't want my brain to age any faster. And part of why, again, I have a lot of concerns, both as a physician and, you know, just as a person is because I have a strong family history of Alzheimer's. My wonderful mother, who's really one of the most accomplished people I know, she was an English professor, a lawyer, she taught law in law school, she was a dancer, a tennis player, squash player, she played bridge in the Olympics. I mean, she was Wonder Woman and she's perfectly healthy at 82. Literally her only medical history is a bunionectomy, but she has advanced Alzheimer's and she has a very strong family history of Alzheimer's, two copies of the APOE4 gene, a mother who had Alzheimer's, three maternal aunts, cousins. I mean, it's a very, very strong lineage. And I think her mental and physical activity and her good habits kind of held off the progression she was diagnosed relatively later than they were and has had a slower course. But at the end of the day, with that very strong genetic component, that train was leaving the station, unfortunately. So here's the thing, when we think about cognition, dementia, Alzheimer's, different things, it's important to remember it is multifactorial. Yes, just like colon cancer, for example, you have genetic forms of colon cancer, like familial adenomatous polyposis, where virtually no matter what you do, other than removing the colon, you are going to get colon cancer. But that is by far the exception, not the norm. Most people don't have this strong genetic form of colon cancer. They may have a genetic predisposition, but remember the genes are just a suggestion. It's what you actually do in your real life. It's the nurture part, right? The nature part of the, is the genes. It's the nurture part that determines whether or not that disease will get expressed. And so if we look just at Alzheimer's for a moment, what we see is that there are significant taxonomic differences in the microbiome. Well, what do I mean by taxonomic differences? I mean different species differences. So the types of bacteria, the numbers, the diversity in people with Alzheimer's is different from their age match cohort without Alzheimer's. We know that. Furthermore, we know that if we give patients with Alzheimer's long courses of antibiotics, and I believe this study was done looking at tuberculosis. So the people in the study got about a year of an antibiotic called rifampin and another antibiotic, and they found not good. Alzheimer's patients declined with long-term antibiotics like that. So this is not the first study to look at the effects of antibiotics on cognition, but it is one of the largest studies of 14,500 women and again, what's shocking is that it was, you know, two months of antibiotics cumulatively over a period of several years. There's not a lot of antibiotics, especially when you consider that people are being put on antibiotics for acne, people are being put on prophylactic antibiotics long-term to prevent urinary tract infections, terrible idea. People are being given antibiotics long-term for Lyme disease, for chronic Lyme, where it's not particularly effective. So, you know, it's not, this is not just, okay, we're giving you an antibiotic because you're flesh eating bacteria and you really need it. People are being given antibiotics prophylactically for suppressive purposes, for inflammatory conditions. In the two diseases I treat, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, I see my colleagues, many of them putting people on long-term antibiotics to help with flare-ups. So, the danger is in this repetitive or extended antibiotic usage. And, you know, again, we've seen the data from kids on how deleterious that can be and the lag, and we're seeing the same thing here. So what we know from these studies is that when you take a course of antibiotics, so the famous study that Marty Blazer wrote about in his great book, Missing Microbes, 
was that, and you know, he was the chief of infectious diseases at NYU at the time. I'm not sure if he still is. So I always say when you have the infectious disease doctors raising the alarm, they're the ones who really use the antibiotics and are most expert. And when you have them saying, be careful with this, we all really need to pay attention. So in his book, he described that a five-day course of antibiotics can wipe out as much as a third of your gut bacteria. And here's the thing, while many of those species will come back and will recover, there's no question that you will have long-term changes, not just in taxonomy, again, in the you know, various species that are there, but also in the genes. And here is just a remarkable thing that I still have a hard time wrapping my head around. 99%, more than 99%, I think the number is somewhere around 99.5% of our genetic material is actually microbial. That's right. So we have about 23,000 human genes and about 3.3 million microbial genes that we know of. So we are outnumbered by our microbial genetic material by a large degree. And so you know, when you look at a lot of the important functions going on in our body, the synthesis of digestive enzymes and hormones, et cetera, it's actually not our, as in the human genetic material that is guiding that, it is a microbial genetic material. And so what they've found in these antibiotic studies is that the genes change too. So it's not just, okay, I have less Enterococcus faecalis or more of this, or, or rather probably more Enterococcus faecalis, the not so good, and less Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, the really good. It is that this is affecting what's going on genetically. It's literally turning those genetic switches on or off, which is ultimately working in concert with the environmental influences like antibiotics, like diet, like exposure to nature, et cetera, to determine whether disease gets expressed or not. And that is as true for things like obesity and hypertension and heart disease as it is for dementia, we're finding out. So talking about heart disease, there is a landmark study that shows that for people in their fifth and sixth decade, and I believe the influence was more significant in men, antibiotic use in the fifth and sixth decade can result in cardiovascular disease. Not earlier, not later, for some reason. It seems to be in that fifth and sixth decade. And so what I want us, the point of all of this is not to terrify you, you know, if you're really sick and you need to, to take an antibiotic. But I want us, and by us, I mean lay people and physicians to be better stewards of medication in general. And I want to remind you as a consumer, nothing is free, right? Everything that you take, that you ingest, and that's true for food, and it's particularly true for medication, has potentially some negative downstream effect. So again, if you are about to be consumed by flesh-eating bacteria, if you have a proven bacterial meningitis, if you have a kidney infection, by all means, and an antibiotic is really necessary, go for it. But if you have a cough and a cold, we know in this study, in the same nurse's study, when they drilled down and they looked at what the indications were for antibiotic use, they were things where antibiotics were very questionable as to whether they were indicated. So the number one indication for antibiotic use in the study was respiratory tract infections. And we know that the CDC says that 80% of the time when an antibiotic is prescribed for your upper respiratory tract infection in the US, 80% of the time, it does not meet their criteria for whether an antibiotic is actually necessary. So we know a lot of these infections, for example, are viral or they're minor self-limited infections. So Respiratory tract infections, number one. Urinary tract infections, number two. Another area where you know you go in, you have burning symptoms. Often it is, you know, there's a little contamination, but it's not an actual infection that requires antibiotic treatment. But they do a urinalysis at the doctor's office. They're like, yeah, you've got white blood cells in your urine, and they give you an antibiotic. Well, let me remind you that white blood cells in the urine does not equal a urinary tract infection. You know, that is not a sterile area when you cat, when you do the clean catch urine, I'm bending down to show you, I'm doing my clean catch urine. It's a good thing the camera doesn't go down that far. Um, so when you, you know, you wipe with your little alcohol pad that they give you and you collect the urine, that's still not sterile. So it's very, very possible that you're gonna get white blood cells in the urine and that does not equal a urinary tract infection. To diagnose a urinary tract infection, they have to do a urine culture. 
And that typically takes three to five days. So if you're walking into the GYN's office or your primary care doctor's office complaining of symptoms and you're walking out with an antibiotic prescription that same day, for sure they have not, they're not basing that on the results of a urine culture. Now, there are some circumstances where they're going to go ahead and treat anyway. If you have pyuria, which means you have pus in the urine, that can be a sign of a higher infection, even up into the kidneys. If you have a high fever, et cetera. But if you just have some burning and frequent urination, and you think you have a UTI and they're doing a quick dip with a urine sample and saying you have white blood cells and giving you an antibiotic not a good idea. You must see what the urine culture shows. And if the urine culture shows more than 100,000 organisms growing in concert with symptoms, that equals a diagnosis of a urinary tract infection. And then of course they can quantify, you know, what's growing and also tell you the specific uh, organism and whether it's sensitive to the antibiotic you're on. So, you know, you're growing Klebsiella, you're growing E. coli, et cetera. There are also lots of things that I do with my patients for um, treating urinary tract infections like D-manos, et cetera, but it depends. You know, if somebody has pyelonephritis, which is an actual infection that's going up and affecting the kidneys, I, you don't play around with that. But so much of the time I find people don't even have a urinary tract infection. They have a little irritation. They have maybe additional bacteria there and I can put them on some D-manos and you know, flush your kidneys out, et cetera. So again, let me remind you, this is not medical advice here. This is educational. So I am not your doctor and any decisions to be made about treatment of upper respiratory tract infection, urinary tract infection, acne, et cetera, make it with your doctor. But, but if you're interested in a rewilding approach to illness in how to approach things like sinus infections and acne and urinary tract infections, et cetera, without antibiotics and to get more informed about when an antibiotic is necessary. And even more importantly, the questions to ask your doctor so that you can be good stewards together, check out my second book, The Microbiome Solution, and also the gutless, uh, gutless.com and the blogs. We have several of those, but if you want the most, we have a whole chapter in The Microbiome Solution on you know what to do, doses of D-manos, et cetera. So just a little sales pitch there to check that out. Okay, let's see. Okay, we're at 1220, so let's take a question or two. Um, what do I use instead of antibiotics for infections in children, airs, et cetera? How do you prevent infections? I'm so glad you asked that question because that was in my daughter what led to the just sort of never ending cycle of antibiotics. So the first thing I wanna tell you is that most or, or many, if not most, air infections in children are viral, okay? And there's no way to tell from the presentation whether it's bacterial or viral, you know, high fever versus lower fever, screaming versus not screaming. So you can't tell by that what's going on. And obviously taking your kid into the pediatrician to be assessed is a great idea. So there are things that, especially with young kids, there are things, okay, so they're sort of more objective things like the kid's temperature, maybe they draw labs and they look at the white blood cell, et cetera. Um, but then there are things that are, are more sort of a gestalt, right? So is the child still making eye contact? Do they seem alert? Do they seem you know, really out of it, especially younger children? where you can't get a reliable answer. Maybe they can't even speak yet. They can't even talk yet. So, you know, having somebody eyeball the child is important. I mean, I was able to do that a lot with my daughter because I'm a doctor, but um, if you're not a healthcare professional, I strongly recommend that you have somebody take a look at your kid if you think they have an infection. But here's the part that I want you to remember. This famous study from the journal Pediatrics that showed that pediatricians prescribe an antibiotic 63% of the time if they perceive the parent wants one and only 7% when they don't. So that leaves a lot of gray zone. And so really important to say like, look, is, is an antibiotic absolutely necessary here? Could this be a viral infection that my kid is having? What's a natural course of this if we didn't use an antibiotic? What should I watch for? Should I watch for lethargy? Should I keep taking the temperature? What should I do? And it may be that your child really needs an antibiotic, but what I want you to remember that whether or not that antibiotic is indicated, it doesn't change the fact that that, that antibiotic is going to have significant side effects, right? It's not that, oh, if the antibiotic is indicated because they're really sick, you get a pass. Regardless of the indication, that antibiotic is going to remove pathogens and also remove a lot of healthy bacteria. And in children, the data, this is what the science shows, like it or not, that extensive use 
in infancy can be associated with emotional problems like anxiety, depression, uh, issues with cognition. So, you know, lower performance cognitively, problems reading, ADHD, et cetera. So what that really tells us is that it is our job as parents to be the best stewards for our children. And I unfortunately don't think I was a good steward because I just trusted that the medical community knew what they were doing and were keeping track. And we had a wonderful pediatrician, you know, the best, but I realized that she really had no idea how many courses of antibiotics my kid had had. And when I finally added it all up and presented it to her, she was as shocked as I was. So, you know, pediatricians are busy. They have hundreds, sometimes thousands of patients. And again, this is where it can be a really a great idea, not just for your kid, but for you to have a spreadsheet, literally. I'm sure there's some app for it where you're keeping track of you know, the antibiotic you took, the date, how long you took it for, et cetera, because it's very easy to lose track, you know, it's, and it's one of those things, right, in medicine, we always sort of the behind the scenes um, formula we use when we ask people how much alcohol they drink, and they give us a number like, oh, I drink two drinks per week, we always double it. When they ask, when we ask them how much they're exercising, we half it. If they're like, oh, I exercise four days a week, we write, we think, okay, you're exercising twice a week. Well, with antibiotic use is one of those things that people underestimate how many antibiotics they've taken. So in my practice, in my intake sheet, I ask people how many courses of antibiotics. And I know for new patients before I see them, but I always ask them again. And I'll tell you nine times out of 10, there's additional antibiotic use they forgot about. Because I'll say, okay, what about apnea? Oh yeah, I was on doxycycline for two years, you know, my senior year of high school and freshman year of college. Or oh yeah, I got treated for, they thought I had Lyme disease. It turns out I didn't. I got a month of doxy or, oh yeah, I have a mitral valve prolapse. And every time I went for, in for teeth cleaning, I got prophylactic antibiotics. So that's another like, you know, 50 courses of antibiotics potentially over their life. So I think it's a really helpful thing to do. If you have children, do it for them first, you know, let's save the kids and keep track if you're not sure, check with your pediatrician, get records and really start to keep track and follow it because here's the deal. Like, again, this stuff, it's not just, we know chronic antibiotic exposure is linked to chronic diseases. We know about obesity. We know about cardiovascular disease. We know about certain kinds of cancer, including colon cancer. We know autoimmune disease, but now it, we're getting into the neuropsychiatric realm and we're seeing that depression, anxiety, certain types of autism, even schizophrenia in some forms can be linked. And remember, there are really two ways that these antibiotics can affect what's going on in your brain. One is they can cross the blood brain barrier. Just like in your gut, you have that lining, the gut lining, that one cell layer thick that protects everything on the inside of that, which is all your bodily organs, bloodstream, et cetera, with everything on the outside, which is what's going on in your gut, the bacteria, the undigested food, et cetera. So you have a gut lining and it's a membrane and it is permeable, meaning things can go back and forth. In your brain, you have a blood brain barrier and it is also permeable. So certain drugs can go through. So any drug that you take that affects your cognitive status is potentially going through your blood brain barrier affecting your brain. So antihistamines, antidepressants, sleeping medication, et cetera, those are all things that affect your brain. And antibiotics can work by directly, some of them cross the blood brain barrier and affect the brain. But what we're finding with a lot of these antibiotics is they work through the gut brain axis. So they alter the communities, the taxonomy of microbes in your gut that affects you know, the amount of different species, and that affects the production of neurotransmitters and other chemicals that work on the brain. And so it is really through the alteration of the gut microbial community. And so even if a medication doesn't have a direct effect on your brain, if it's affecting the microbial community, it is potentially um, affecting the neurotransmitters, the different metabolites, some types of bacteria produce neuroinflammatory. We talked about this last week, these neuroinflammatory peptides that cause inflammation in the brain. So that can be the pathway. Okay, let's see what's in the chat and take a few more questions. All right. Um, for someone with a joint replacement, is a prophylactic antibody prior to dental work always necessary? Thank you. Heidi, thanks for that question. So 
I can't speak too much for the dental recommendations, but I know about the GI recommendations because I was on a committee called the Standards of Practice Committee for one of our large GI organizations, and we were in charge of reviewing these recommendations. And I will tell you that every year we dropped indications. So it used to be if you had mitral valve prolapse, you needed antibiotics during colonoscopy. We dropped that because the data didn't support it. The theory behind that was that if you had an abnormal heart valve, uh, bacteria during colonoscopy could, you know, somehow get through the membrane, travel through the bloodstream, seed that valve and cause endocarditis. Well, it turned out the risk of Clostridium difficile, an antibiotic-associated diarrheal illness, the risk of that and illness and even death from that was far greater than the risk of endocarditis. So we dropped most of the antibiotic prophylactic requirements during colonoscopy. And just like dental procedures, you know, that we consider the mouth kind of part of the GI tract. So colonoscopy, biopsies, removing polyps, that's very invasive. Here's what I recommend you do, because what I found is that my GI colleagues were mostly unaware of the changes in the guidelines. They were going based on what the guidelines were 20, 30 years ago when they trained, and they were not keeping up with the changes. I suspect that that happens similarly in the dental world. So what I would recommend to you, Heidi, is that you go online and you look for recommendations for prophylactic antibiotics with a joint replacement. And it will give you the recommendations based on the procedure. So for example, with colonoscopy, if you were just having a diagnostic colonoscopy, we were looking and we weren't biopsying, we weren't removing polyps, we weren't doing anything more invasive, very few conditions required prophylactic antibiotics. But if we were doing something invasive where we were you know, penetrating the gut lining, then it changed. So I want you to look up the American Dental Association recommendations for prophylactic antibiotics for dental procedure. And again, for teeth cleaning, there might be none, but if you're having an implant, there might be something, or if you're having an extraction, there may be something. And then, you know, print out a copy and show your dentist in a very lovely and charming way, as I'm sure you are a lovely and charming person, Heidi, and just say, by the way, um, I looked at the recent recommendations and I noticed that it seems that I don't need antibiotics anymore. And while I know you might be prescribing them just to be extra careful, and I appreciate that, I'd rather not have them unless they're absolutely necessary. Because I'm telling you, your dentist is concerned with the one thing, you not getting an infection in your mouth. Your dentist does not care, I shouldn't say does not care. Your dentist is not focused on your gut microbiome and whether or not you develop cognitive decline seven years from now. That's not their focus. So it would be great if, you know, everybody was integrated and everybody knew and cared about everything else. It's just not the way that, that medicine works. So I want you to look that up. And guess what, Heidi, you're going to be educating your dentist, the same way my amazing patients took the time to educate me. And now I know like lots of useful stuff. Okay. So I want you to remember that these healthcare interactions are a dialogue, not a monologue, and that you are sharing invaluable information with your healthcare practitioner. And um, I hope that works out well. Okay. All right. Let's see what else we have here in the chat. Then we go to questions. Um, uh, from Al, it seems more and more prophylactic antibiotics are being given for many procedures. Yeah, that's so true, Al. And you know, part of why that is, is because we live in this litigious world where everybody's trying to see why a, you know, well, I want to make sure she can get an infection. Doesn't matter that I wiped out half her microbiome and she's going to have problems down the road. At least she didn't have an infection on my watch. And I found when I was um, on the standards of practice committee for the ASGE, the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and we were soliciting feedback from our several thousand gastroenterology members, there was a lot of concern along those lines. I mean, people practice defensive medicine or defensive dentistry for a reason, right? People get sued. And so there was a lot of concern from gastroenterologists about, well, you know, are you sure? that I shouldn't give the antibiotic because what if this happens? And so what we had to show them was that the risk of having a side effect, I don't mean a long-term seven years from now, you have a decrease in, or four years from now in cognition that nobody can link back to this. I'm talking about an immediate side effect like an antibiotic associated diarrhea or a Clostridium difficile or an allergic reaction, that that risk was higher, okay? And I have even had patients where, 
they were having dental work. And these were patients who had severe dysbiosis, alterations of the gut microbiome, where literally one more course of antibiotics would just tip them over the edge into a really bad place. So these were people who, you know, they'd had recurrent C. diff or serious signs of a disrupted microbiome. And they're having procedures. I remember one woman was having a cystoscopy, just a diagnostic cystoscopy, where they do instrument the urethra and go up and look at the bladder. And this is not, according to the guidelines, a diagnostic cystoscopy is not a procedure that required antibiotics in this particular individual. But her urologist was so insistent on it that I had to write a letter. And she, I suggested to her, I said, I want you to go home and I want you to write a little letter saying, I understand, you know, the risks and consequences of having this procedure without antibiotics. And I nonetheless, you know, despite being fully aware of all the potential complications, including serious infection, et cetera, I do not want to receive prophylactic antibiotics. And basically kind of, you know, recusing him from any legal fallout if she developed an infection. And that was quite frankly, his concern, right? And maybe he had been sued. Maybe he had done a cystoscopy and somebody developed an infection, you know, one out of several thousand patients. I don't know. But um, I wrote a letter saying I'm not recommending it. Here's why. And I don't like telling other practitioners how to practice. I don't like being told how to practice. I don't mind getting suggestions or, you know, people giving me information. But I don't want another physician saying you can't do that. Um, because people's practice patterns are, are based on their experience, right? And I don't know what his experience was, but I thought it was helpful as a colleague to write a letter saying not so much don't prescribe the antibiotic or reminding him of the guidelines from his own field, but saying from my perspective as her gastroenterologist, this is why an antibiotic is potentially problematic. So I wrote that and then she wrote the letter, this sort of legal, you know, get out of jail card. And he finally, finally um, agreed to do it without, and she was fine. But the other thing to ask is to say, you know, don't present it as I'm not taking an antibiotic, no matter what, present it as I'd rather not take an antibiotic because, you know, I have these gut problems or for whatever reason. And, but I'm willing to, if I really have to. So could you tell me, and again, this is all in the microbiome solution. Could you tell me um, what are the circumstances? What should I watch for? You know, should I watch for fever? Should I watch for this? And, and actually give me the prescription and I'll take it home. I'll even fill it. So I have it on hand. If something happens at two in the morning, I will have it there if I need it, but I'm hoping I don't need it. Okay. So then instead of seeming like, you know, you're some like really, you know, kind of high maintenance patient, who's trying to tell them what to do, you are just showing them that you're a well-informed consumer and you're advocating for your own health. And, you know, this is your preference, but you're willing to do it their way if need be. So I hope that's helpful. Okay. What else have we got? Um, oh, you're so welcome, Heidi. Where's the best place to get up-to-date information on the oral microbiome, how to foster the most resilient microbiome and how to manage imbalances and infections? Yeah, so oral microbiome, you know, I think that's just a Google search, Susan, for, you know, what the latest articles are, because here's the deal, beware of sites selling you a product, okay? So if you go to some site and it's like, oh, how to, you know, rejigger your oral microbiome and you buy this oral probiotic, a lot of what's on that site is going to be marketing. So I would do a Google search on the oral microbiome and, uh, you know, oral microbiome recovery after antibiotics, et cetera, and, and look and make sure that that's a peer-reviewed article. I don't have something at my fingertips to give you because I'm more a gut microbiome kind of gal, but um, I'll tell you that there is just a wealth of information. And I like, you know, a lot of the NCBI um, articles, but you'll be able to tell when you look at it, you know, what kind of, you know, this is obviously not going to be marketing from a probiotic website. So that's what I'd recommend. Okay. Um, okay, let's go to some questions. Okay. To get back to Al's question, boy, Al, I really sidetracked on you, didn't I? I'm so sorry. What do I use instead of antibiotics for infections in children, errors, et cetera? How do you prevent infection? So the first answer to that is you've got to make sure this is an actual bacterial infection. Because as you know, Al, antibiotics have zero efficacy against viruses, zero zip, zilch, nada, nothing 
All an antibiotic is going to do in that circumstance is remove some of the healthy bacteria that are there to fight the viral infection. So you have to determine that this is truly a bacterial infection. And that can be tricky. The thing that worked tremendously for our daughter is tubes. She kept having these repeated episodes of air infections, otitis media, and pharyngitis, sore throats, and strep, and so on. And it turned out that those eustachian tubes weren't open enough. So we finally, when she was about four, took her... Uh, to a fantastic ENT practice here in, um, in DC, Feldman ENT, and, and Mark Dattelbach was the wonderful ENT who did the tubes. And the funny thing I remember about that, she was about four. We're pretty healthy eaters, but I'm pretty sure I promised her some pancakes at this diner after. <laughs> Wasn't a lot of pancakes happening at the time in our house. And so I remember she marched in there into the surgical suite and she lay down on the stretcher and she took the mask from the anesthesiologist and put it over her face like, yeah, I'm ready. Start giving me some ether or whatever it is you're giving me. And the anesthesiologist couldn't believe it. He was like, normally kids like they're cowering in the corner and we have to pull them away from the parents, but not Sydney. She literally lay on the stretcher, took the mask from him, put it over her face. And I think she started breathing deeply. She was very motivated <laughs> for those pancakes. Okay. So um, the tubes helped tremendously with her, and that sort of ended the cycle of the frequent infection. So it's a good, and you know, again, I wish I had gone to the ENT sooner. And I, you know, our pediatrician didn't recommend it because again, she wasn't keeping track, I don't think, of how many antibiotics Sydney had gotten. So I finally, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist, I don't know about tubes. And uh, asked around and somebody, you know, with my medical colleagues and asked her, well, what do you think? And she said, sure, go see the ENT. And he said, absolutely. And the tubes really made a big difference. Um, the other thing is, you know, we had gone to an allergist and immunologist before the ENT and she had recommended long-term antibiotics to kind of suppress what was going on. So you know, maybe that was a practice at the time, but that's certainly not something that I would recommend. Sometimes they have fluid in the air and that fluid is getting contaminated, et cetera. And she had a little fluid in the air, so she had wanted to use a long-term antibiotic. So, you know, again, you, you have to do a little navigating, research, et cetera, but um, that's worth considering the tubes. Okay, Vicki, how can I naturally treat acne? My derm wants me to continue minocycline for another two to three months after taking for a month. Oh, and here's the thing, Vicki, if we look at people with acne, like my daughter struggled a lot with acne and continues to as a teenager, we see a very strong line between previous antibiotic use early in childhood and then antibiotics in teenage years and onwards. So, you know, one of the things, it's really hard to find dermatologists who are willing to treat acne without antibiotics. The tide is changing, but it's hard. So it's worth considering some food triggers. We know that dairy is a big trigger, particularly low-fat milk. Um, yogurt seems to be less, but cheese, low-fat milk, etc. So one thing to consider is to try eliminating dairy completely to see Chocolate, definitely a trigger, refined oils, et cetera. So again, this is something, quick Google search, you can find a lot of the data. And again, I have some, some uh, recommendations in the microbiome solution for how to treat acne. But I'll tell you that there are both prescription medications as well as more natural remedies right now that can be very effective. So depending on how severe your acne is, um, I would really, when you go into the dermatologist, say, look, I really want to clear this up, but I'm interested in a non-antimicrobial approach and see what they come up with. And then again, don't forget to evaluate the role of diet. You know, diet and stress are two big things. So is there, you know, start with a dairy and chocolate, refined sugars. Are you eating a lot of junk food? Are you, I'm sure you're not, but refined oil. So see what you can do to clean up the diet. And then um, also think about products that you might be using to irritate it. A lot of times, I mean, I, I actually sleep sometimes with a little bonnet because my hair gets all over my face when I sleep. And I'm, I'm a curly girl, so I use a lot of product in my hair so it's not out here. And that product can get on your skin at night, especially if you're having a lot of acne in the forehead or when I sweat. If I'm running or I'm, you know, biking or whatever, I always have a headband on because I don't want those hair products to get onto my skin. So um, those are some things to think about. But I'll tell you, there are a lot of alternatives um, to antibiotics now in the derm world. Okay. 
So Al, what are the effects of antihistamines on brain, gut, and other? Yeah, so again, what I want to remind you, Al, is that anything that changes your, that alters your, your state of alertness, for example, is affecting your brain. So some anti antihistamines rev you up and you, you know, are very alert and others make you sleepier like Benadryl. They're both affecting brain. And interestingly, I mean, years ago, this has been 12 years ago, I was doing a little segment on local news about um, the effects of some various common drugs on the brain. And this was well, but I mean, this was definitely before even the first book, Gut Bliss. And I'm not sure my kid was even born yet. So this might've been 20 years ago. And one of the things I found doing research on this, Al, and I'm not, I'm not saying this just to you specifically, but antihistamines can cause um, problems with impotence. And I did not know that. And I'm pretty sure I was married because I was shocked. And I remember telling my husband and he was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that um, can cause reversible problems with that. So um, I just mentioned that as, and it's not just affecting brain, obviously affecting other organs too, or maybe that is through the brain that effect. But um, yeah, so you, you really have to be careful with these drugs. Okay, Adna, hi again, Adna. I think you were with us last time or time before. Um, okay, so I'm reading what you've written to me, many antibiotic treatments in the past. What do I recommend for prevention from UTI? Okay, so I am not telling this to you in a medical capacity, but there is something called D-mannose and you can look it up and you can look up the dosage, et cetera. And in clinical trials at a certain dosage, D-mannose has been found to be actually more effective than prophylactic antibiotics, probably because it's not removing all the healthy bacteria from um, the genitourinary tract. And the way d tends to work is it prevents E. coli from adhering to the lining of the bladder and causing an infection. So I want you to look up d And again, it's all the dose, everything in my book, Microbiome Solution, but you can just Google that too. All right. Um, more and more profit. Yes. Profit. What's the best way to restore your gut biome after 15 day course of antibiotics? Okay, Rose. The best way to do that is to not take the antibiotic in the first place. Okay. That's the top one, two, or three way is unless, you know, this is some terrible situation, death is imminent to really try not to take that antibiotic. If you have taken the antibiotic, probiotics can be helpful. Mushroom tea can be helpful. There's a whole ton of things. And again, there's a long, long list in the microbiome solution. Let me see if I have it back here. I would just actually read you all the things, but, um, yeah, it is, you know, certain probiotics taken, you know, for about a month after, and you want to start them when you start the antibiotic and in between. So as far away from each dose of antibiotics as possible. So if you were taking like a 8 a.m. and a 4 p.m. antibiotic course, you'd want to take it at about noon to, you know, have it be as far away from both of those. Um, shiitake and maitake mushrooms and mushroom tea can be really helpful. Obviously eating a lot of fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi, not yogurt and kombucha, the fermented vegetables, sauerkraut and kimchi, super helpful for restoring the microbiome. In fact, probably more helpful than most over-the-counter probiotics is, uh, you know, a couple of tablespoons of one of those and the thing is, people just don't like it, right? But when you realize like this is actual medicine, um, so the fermented foods, obviously eating a high fiber diet is really helpful because you're feeding the healthy microbes, cutting way down on sugar. If you're, and if you're somebody who's prone to yeast infections after antibiotics, you may want to do a like zero sugar, like really serious kind of anti-yeast regimen just to prevent the yeast overgrowth. And um, there's some other things too, like alcohol in the setting of antibiotics is really problematic because many of these antibiotics are metabolized through the liver and so is alcohol. So you're putting like a heavier strain on your liver. You want to avoid taking antibiotics with proton pump inhibitors because that's a double whammy. The proton pump inhibitors by blocking acid are disrupting the microbiome and so is the antibiotic. Just checking the time. So, um, so that's another thing. So it's a whole long exhaustive list in the microbiome solution, but I hope I gave you some highlights there. Um, but by far though, you know, I like to think about things. I always like this three thing. And I think it drives um, my, my chief of operations, Leslie Amberg, a little crazy because I'm always like, we need three takeaways. We need the top three. I, I, give me three important things that I have to get done today. So I, I don't know why, something about the threes. 
And when I think about systems, like it's like my dirt, sweat, veg. I mean, you could add sleep to that, but I'm like, no, just what are the top three things I try and do every day? Um, get out in nature and get a little dirty. I actually have on my yoga outfit here to head to yoga in a little bit. Um, so, and I'll probably walk there today. So I'll be out in nature a little bit. So, you know, dirt, sweat, break a sweat, get some exercise and veg, eat some vegetables. But in truth, again, like, you know, minimal or no alcohol, get enough sleep. These are, you know, de-stress. These are all important things too. But along the lines of my three recommendations for, you know, how to restore the microbiome after antibiotics, think about remove, replace, restore. Remove any other things that you're doing that could be messing up your microbiome. So that would include steroids and you know, oral contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and proton pump inhibitor, inhibitors, et cetera. So look in your medicine cabinet and because, you know, you could be eating all the kimchi and sauerkraut in the world. If you are still doing something every day that is disrupting your microbiome, it's one step forward, one step back, and you're just basically treading water, you're not improving. So remove the things, the practices. If you're having, you know, two glasses of wine a night, as many people have been doing with this sort of pandemic era we're in, that is also disrupting your microbiome in a big way. So remove foods, practices, et cetera, that are detrimental to your microbiome. Replace essential microbes that have been lost through, you know, one ways exposure to soil microbes. There's a fascinating study that showed that people that put their hand in soil every day for two weeks, regardless of whether they were actually gardening, just having your hands in soil that they saw significant changes in the microbiome after just two weeks. Isn't that incredible? Does that make you wanna go out and like get dirty, right? So exposure to soil microbes or probiotics. I'm always a little like, you know, one eyebrow raised with a probiotic because so many of the kind, the brands that they're selling off the shelf just aren't robust enough. And again, in the microbiome solution, I have a whole guide to choosing a probiotic that tells you, you know, which essential species it should have. and um, also, uh, you know, what to look for, like more than 50 billion colony forming units, refrigerated or not, et cetera. So some of this stuff, I mean, I promise you, I'm not trying to just get you to buy my book, but, you know, some of this stuff is a whole chapter. So I can't give you all the information from a whole chapter in, you know, a few minutes here. So that's why, that's why I wrote the book to help you with all of this stuff. So do check it out. Um, so remove replace the gut bacteria, exposure to soil microbes, a good probiotic, and then restore is the diet. So that's large amounts of indigestible fiber, what we call max microbiota accessible carbohydrates, the things that the healthy bacteria like to eat. So really, um, you know, fibrous vegetables, especially the stems, the broccoli, the asparagus, the celery, but also things like oats and legumes, uh, lentils, chickpeas, all of this stuff. And here's the thing, like most things in life that are really worthwhile involve a little effort, right? If something were really, it's like when I see all these weight loss things, I just take this pill. I'm like, if that worked, nobody would be overweight, right? Because not being overweight is really hard in our society. Like it involves vigilance, sometimes deprivation, constant awareness. It's hard. If you're not paying attention, like it, it's really hard to maintain an ideal weight. Well, it's kind of the same thing with the microbiome. Like if you think, you know, I'll just take an antibiotic and then I'll just take a probiotic. Like it doesn't work that way. And I know you guys know that, right? And that's why you're here. You guys are very sophisticated, but, um, you know, it is this idea that I'll just take this probiotic pill is so magical thinking. And I really want you to be aware of the other things around that that you need to do. Okay, let's go to some more questions. We'll go back to the chat. Every time I touch this thing, it starts shaking. The whole thing's gonna fall over. Okay, um, D Manos. Oh, good. Somebody provided in the chat. Yeah, you're absolutely right. D dash M-A-N-N-O-S-E. Yeah. Okay. What is recommended for treatment of Lyme disease besides antibiotics? If I find a tick on body, should antibiotics be used? Yeah. So let me just tell you, let me pull that up again, um, Maria, that I am not a Lyme disease expert. So I am very reluctant. In fact, I will not going to recommend how to treat Lyme disease. But what I do want to tell you is that it's very, very important. Two things to make sure the diagnosis is correct. I mean, there's a lot of kind of Lyme hysteria in this area where I live in Washington, DC, and Lyme disease is 
a real thing and something we do all need to be concerned about. But in our Lyme hysteria, sometimes we forget about the gut microbiome. And remember that even if you do have Lyme disease, you are going to do some damage to your gut microbiome with the treatment. So you want to make absolutely sure that you do. I am not a fan of some of these uh, Lyme disease tests. And I'm saying this as a gastroenterologist, not as a microbiologist or infectious disease specialist, but some of the testing I have seen that is used by the um, more alternative practitioners, let me just say, I've never seen a negative test, okay? Every single person who gets tested on this seems to be positive. And so that should cause one eyebrow to be raised. So I have patients coming in frequently who will say, I saw this infectious disease doctor and they were great, but you know, the testing they did was negative. And so I went to this other alternative practitioner and their testing was positive. That right there, you know, one eyebrow raise gives me pause. And because again, I see the patients coming in, they bring the testing and I'm like, how is it that I've seen, you know, 120 patients this year with Lyme and all of them had a positive hygienics and, you know, 80% of them had a negative other thing. So just like in the gut world, you know, there are a lot of these tests that are really designed as a portal to sell you something, a product, get you on antibiotics, whatever it is. So I really recommend that you see an actual infectious disease doctor for the diagnosis of Lyme, not an alternative practitioner and not even a primary care doctor. An infectious disease doctor needs to tell you, yes, you have Lyme disease, in my opinion, because once you go down that road with the antibiotics, there's no reversing that really, you know, after your three months of doxy. And what I've seen with some of the doctors who tend to overdiagnose and overprescribe is that they put you on, you know, three months of antibiotics, still not better. Okay, well, because you need three months more and you need more and you need more. I mean, I've had patients who have been on 10 years of antibiotics. The data, and again, I'm not a Lyme expert, but the data that I'm aware of shows that antibiotics have minimal utility, if any, against chronic Lyme. So you need to be seeing somebody who's an expert on this. If you think you have chronic Lyme, who's, you know, recommending things that actually have been proven to be effective and not just hammering you with antibiotics that may have little or no benefit and lots of side effects. So the first thing, again, make sure the diagnosis is correct and then, you know, talk about treatment and what's going on. And yeah, if you've, you know, if you've been bitten by a tick or if you can isolate the tick and put it in a little bottle, that's great. Or even take a picture because the infectious disease docs are great at uh, being able to identify the organism, right? So if you can capture that picture, if you have that rash initially, you want to take a picture of that typical bullseye rash. So you want to photo document or even live capture the bug as much as possible, because that's really going to help them to determine whether this indeed was um, something that could have been Lyme disease versus, you know, it's just something else. And along those lines, we were in South Carolina this weekend, my husband and I, our daughter's been away in Vermont doing a junior semester of high school at this wonderful place called the Mountain School in Versher. And of course we miss her terribly, but we've also been taking full advantage of empty nesters that so we've been in New York and Miami and all over. And we were in his hometown of Buford, South Carolina this weekend, and we were exploring. We took a ferry to this wonderful place called Defusky Island, and we were on the marsh, and uh, we were all day land speculating, looking at all this marsh front land and thinking about crabbing and shrimping and all this stuff. And he was out on the marsh. We were both in flip-flops. I don't know what we were thinking. You know, I'm always into my rewilding, so I want the dirt and the mud in my toes and all of that. Well, I was okay, but the next day he complained of a lot of itching and he had chigger bites. So chigger, C-H-I-G-G-E-R. If you look it up, if you Google it, the picture of the bites, that's exactly what it looks like. I won't share the picture because I will tell you that chiggers tend to, um, tend to bite you and live in moist areas. So it was like, imagine a swimsuit trunk distribution front and back and around his armpits. And, um, you know, when this turned up, like he didn't know what it was. He was like, I don't know. I, you know, was this, I've been eating oysters. I don't normally eat oysters. He drank a couple beers. He doesn't normally drink beer. We couldn't figure out what it was. And um, it's really handy to have good friends who are dermatologists. So I took some pictures and um, texted them off. And my wonderful friend, Dr. Polly, Paula Borelli, who's an amazing dermatologist and only shout out to Paula, texted right back. She's like, oh yeah, those are bites and told us exactly what to do. So 
um, I don't even know I got on this about Lyme disease, et cetera. So, you know, it's again, important to have somebody who, you know, cause of course me, I would have been like, oh, it's something you ate and it's an eruption. So somebody who knows what this is and who can diagnose you properly. And of course he's all like covered in calamine lotion now. So anyway, I just thought I would overshare that with you. I'm sure he will. He doesn't watch these. Otherwise he would be horrified to know that I'm telling his business. Okay. So where are we? We are at 1258. So let me see if we have one more new question. Um, yeah. So Al, I am familiar with the Hippocrates Institute in theory, and um, I have had a couple of patients over the years who've gone there. I had a patient who had severe Crohn's disease and she'd gone there years before she started seeing me. And I had another patient who had had multiple cancers. Um, I don't know enough about it. You know, I've never been myself. I've never really spoken to people. I've looked at their website. And um, what I will say is that a lot of what they, um, you know, a lot of their approach, which is I'm pretty sure it's a raw vegan diet and they do fasting, et cetera. Um, I think there's a lot of mindfulness. I think that stuff can be really helpful. Um, I think they do some other stuff too that may or not may or may not work, but I can't really give you a good sense, Al, because I haven't checked it out well enough to know whether, you know, this is all being done in a really kind of scientific and reputable way or whether it's not. Um, but again, I will say that the juicing, you know, they eat a lot of sprouted foods, et cetera, the things you pointed out, um, the raw food, the fasting, these are all things that can be great. And so, you know, one way to maybe incorporate some of that is to, you know, true North, to, you know, they do a lot of fasting is if you're interested in that stuff. And, and there's certainly, you know, very well established health benefits to this stuff is to try some of that at home and see, you know, do some, I have an infrared sauna blanket, which I don't have a sauna in my house, but my infrared sauna blanket was maybe $150 and I'm in it all the time, just because I like to sweat, especially in the winter. And so, you know, try some of that. I always recommend smoothies rather than juicing because you want to get the fiber to feed the microbes, but doing some of that stuff at home. And, uh, you know, I think having a broad spectrum of options for us as consumers is important, right? So I am really glad that we have conventional therapy and we have chemotherapy and biologics and surgery and things like that for when people need them. But I think it's also important that we think about, you know, other things that can be health promoting and health sustaining when they are used judiciously also. And, you know, we have to apply the same bar to both sides, right? Like A, is this actually helping? And B, make sure it's not harmful. Okay. That being said, I just want to thank you all again. These are so great. Please um, send us any comments. Please sign up at gutless.com. We promise you it's only about once a month in your inbox, the blog post, but we do announce the office hours um, with that and you can sign up. We're getting ready to announce June. So that's one way to find out what the June um, showdown with the you know, what we're, what I'm going to be talking about in June is, and it's also a way to give us feedback so I can make sure I'm covering topics that you're interested in. Coming up next week, shy bowel. This is a, this is just a crazy thing. This is how holding a bowel movement in when you should be letting it out can lead to chronic and acute medical problems. So I hope you'll join me for shy bowel next week and I'll see you then.